Gladiator Gang. I'm going to do some broken headstocks or one headstock and one broken neck. Another Tom DeLong 333 Epiphone has arrived. This one's pretty close to mint. Like unplayed. Still got the plastic on the pickup. But it suffered shipping damage. Despite being packed reasonably well for its journey, I'm told. I'm really wary of shipping guitars around. It's risky. It's more risky than most people realize. But when you become a guitar repair person, you start to encounter just how often it happens, and it's depressing. This year I've seen six nice guitars with airline damage. So that is like 5% of what I've repaired so far this year. It's hard to confront because there's an innate sense of loss that happens with these things. Try and fix them up as well as possible, but once they're broken, they're always going to be altered a little bit. Sometimes people have hang-ups about that. This one is a little different from most in that the fracture has taken place in the neck proper, not up in the headstock. And that's because the headstock was really well immobilized in the case. It was supported all the way around, so it couldn't move when it fell. Speculation is the box was dropped on its end, but there's usually a kind of whiplash reaction where all that energy sort of moves up to wherever the weakest link in the chain happens to be. And in this case, it was in the neck behind the nut here. To be honest, this actually looks less bad than in the photographs I saw. I thought the two fractures ran up and met almost in the middle of the neck here, but it looks to me like there's still a good chunk of supporting wood there in the center. So if I can get enough glue into it, it won't be necessary to spline this one, as the fractures, they're diagonal, they're really long, so there's a lot of glue surface, and they seem really tight. And that snugness can also work against me when I'm trying to introduce the glue, though. You know, I might have to drill some little holes for a syringe, because, you know, I have to be able... I don't know if I can flex this open enough to get the glue all the way in. And penetration is paramount. Wow. It's a foreboding sound. Ugh. Here's a kind of cursed activity. I gotta do it, but it feels so wrong. Yeah, I think, you know what, this is good. I think I can get my syringe in there. One thing about these Epiphones is the truss rod adjusting nut is so deep inside. Um, it's really buried in the neck proper, rather than hanging around the nut here. So I'm gonna have to get in there with some wax and see if I can lube it up and make sure that, you know, I don't impede its function with glue. I'm also going to see if I can stuff some around the outside circumference of the nut as well. Uh, the action of the truss rod is probably good enough to break any glue bond that happens between the mahogany and the steel, but you know, I just want to make sure it's able to turn freely. I'm looking closely at this fracture because I want to understand it, and it seems like it almost has a kind of corkscrew effect happening, like it's twisting in this direction. Um, that's important to me because when it comes time to put the clamps on, and I'm going to use surgical tubing for that, I want to wrap in the opposite direction so that it will hold things down tightly. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to get a perfect glue joint. The two surfaces here might not meet in perfect alignment. So there's probably going to end up being a little bit of sanding to do. Might lose a bit of the finish here. So I can push down as hard as I might and it's not going to go right back down again. Sometimes weird stresses are relieved. Sometimes, you know, parts change a little bit once they've broken apart from each other. And on this side I've got one little dangly piece here which I would really like to preserve. So I'm going to have to tape that down first before applying the clamps. Squeeze out is bound to be a bit messy, so I'll tape off a portion of the fingerboard and the binding here as well. As you might expect, getting enough glue in there is important. I'll err on the side of too much. I'll just work the crack open and closed and see that I've got good squeeze out coming from every direction. This is fish glue from Lee Valley Tools. Uh, most of the properties of hide glue, except it's uh, usable cold. There are a few other cold hide glue preparations. 
they vary in quality. This stuff I know is good. I've been using it for about 10 years and I've done all kinds of tests with it. It's really strong. It dries really hard. It doesn't like to creep and uh, it's good for this kind of thing. I'll get that piece of tape on there and smooth it down in the direction of that dangling splinter. Then I'll wrap the shaft of the neck with heavy duty surgical tubing. This provides a lot of pressure but it conforms to the curved surfaces in a way that standard clamps won't. It won't cause dents and it's perfect for this kind of situation. After the glue's had a good chance to dry I'll peel off the tape That sat down pretty nicely, actually. To clean up glue left on the surface, I'll lightly dampen the area, let it sit for a minute or two, and then scrub with a paper towel. Using some 600 grit sandpaper, I'll lightly block sand the area. This will do a couple of things. It will start to level out any discrepancy in height in the lacquer on either side of the break, and it will also show any areas where finish might have cracked off during the moment of destruction. The sanding dust will get caught in those and highlight them for me to see. There's a few. Leveling will require a little bit more effort, so I'll break out the razor blade and use that as a scraper on the high side of the crack. There's a feel to this. Modern UV cured polyurethane is usually a little bit thicker than the vintage finishes. There's some depth to it, so I can remove some before I have to really start worrying about scraping or sanding through to the bare wood, which would really complicate things. I don't want to do that if I don't have to. People get concerned about me handling razor blades, but my most traumatic cuts have actually all happened from the corners of freshly planed wood, if you'd believe it. And I'm going to clean out any of the sanding dust in those um, little cavities there. I'll fill the gaps in the lacquer with super glue. The wood glues don't like sticking to the urethane. They tend to beat up and sink away from it, where the cyanoacrylate does a much better job and it really seals the crack, locks in the fish glue. This will take several thin coats before it's proud of the surface and I can sand it back down. See that cut on my finger? That was done on spruce. Little change of plans. I'm going to save the broken headstock for another video because it pairs well with a different guitar. You'll see it in a week or two. They're very exciting guitars. I think it's going to be kind of an epic video. So let's do a setup on a parts caster. This is a Tele put together with some nice components. It's got a really nice light ash body. And this deco inspired pickguard is pretty fantastic. I think that's really great. This is sort of an initial setup. I try and stay away from home built kit guitars and that sort of thing because I think if you're going to do that, if you're going to build it yourself, you need to experience the whole thing from start to finish. And nine times out of ten, there can be real issues with the construction or the assembly, surprises, in other words, that take it from being a one-hour setup job and turn it into an all-day nightmare because you have to track down everything that went wrong in the process and make it right. But in this case, I think it was put together by someone who knew what they were doing. The geometry seems pretty good. And my initial impression is that it's not far from where it needs to be. The action is in the ballpark. There's some room to move the saddles. Yeah, let's measure. The action is hovering around 4 ths And no, I do not reduce that fraction. What am I going to do with 1 16th? 60 thousandths, 1.5 millimeters-ish. I actually like that for the bass strings. Um, usually I'll take it a little bit lower on the treble side, depending on the player and their preference. The relief is around five thousandths, which is pretty low, pretty good. Fender spec is slightly higher, it's eight to twelve thousandths, depending on the radius that's on the fingerboard. Some people want more, some people want less. Some guitars can handle less, some of them need a bit more. It's instrument to instrument. It's a good place to start with, though. The thing that really jumps out at me is the nut height. For one thing, when I slide down to first position, I can feel a sharp corner or an edge on the nut, so I know I'm going to want to soften that because it would really bug me. But the strings have to be pushed down a lot to get to first fret. Like a lot, lot. Uh, I bet this hasn't been refined. It's just the raw nut blank at the full height it was in the package. You know, let's measure this. Yeah, a little more.
Yeah, we're talking 42 thousandths plus. Twice what it needs to be. That could also be the cause for a little bit of fret rattle going on up the fingerboard. Usually the string slope moves away from the frets as it proceeds to the top end of the fingerboard. So it's closest at the first fret, farthest away at the last fret. And that upward angle gives more room for the strings to move at its midpoint. The high nut slots require more effort to fret in these lower positions. Uh, that can contribute to playing out of tune as the string is stretched more. I notice that usually on things like a D chord, an open D chord, sometimes it's impossible to get those three notes sounding right because you're stretching them so much. Um, let's see if we can illustrate that. So the open string is in tune. F. A little bit sharper. So as we move off the board, the strings aren't being stretched as much, so G is closer to right. F sharp is a bit sharp. F is really sharp. Same thing with the B string. Look at that C. Now that varies again on how hard you press the strings down, but even at its lightest. So if I lighten the pressure off, I can just about make the C-sharp play in tune, but there's not enough for the string to sound cleanly. There's no way I can sound the C. When you're setting up a guitar for the first time, the nut is the place to begin. Okay, maybe you do the relief first, because if that's completely out of whack, then you've got no hope. But the nut is the lowest point in the plane of the strings, and it makes no sense to fool with the saddles, the 12th fret action, until you've got this dialed in. Because as soon as you do, all those other measurements will change, sometimes drastically. After you've got the nut dialed in, you might find that the neck needs more relief, and that the saddles will almost certainly need to come up a little bit. And the intonation points for the strings could change slightly too, so it's really the place to begin. Measuring the nut height. Let's review. There are two ways to do it. One is based on numbers, and the other on experiential evaluation. For the numbers, usually we want a distance of about 20 or 21 thousandths between the surface of the first fret and the underside of the bass string. That is about 0.53 millimeters. Why that number? Because it works. Regardless of how high or how low you make the action, it works for all of them. It's the median point in the range of usable nut heights. I can cut the nut slots lower, and eventually it will wear lower than 21 thousandths and still be functional. It could be 15 thousandths or even lower than that and still play cleanly on some guitars. But I want to leave enough so that there will be room for it to wear in. On the treble side, it can start off at 15 or 16 thousandths. That's a good safe height. And like I've said before, we usually measure these using feeler gauges because, you know, you couldn't use a ruler for this. But Ted, you might say, my head is now spinning with numbers. Woe is me. Is there another way of checking this out? And there is. It's called the press test. You depress the string at the third fret and then check that same gap between the first fret and the underside of the string. Now you expect to see a tiny bit of distance between them. If there's no gap, it might be too low. If there's an excessive space, and in this case you could drive a Mack truck through there, you're too high. And this is something that repair people learn to eyeball pretty quickly. You know, you'll measure the first few and then adopt this technique because it's fast. And it also works for those pesky interior strings, which are hard to reach with a feeler gauge. There are also dial indicator devices that sit on the fret. You zero them out on the top of the string and then press it down to get the gap. That'll give you the exact number. They're expensive, but they work well for those people who need to know, you know, the exact height on every string. Most people don't find them necessary. Nut filing technique. I use both um, the single gauged files and also the double-sided ones from Stuart MacDonald. Uh, these ones here, the double-sided ones, actually are tapered uh, in section, which um, it can make, if you've got a lot of material to go through, it can make the job easier. The single ones which are parallel-sided, 
they um, can hang up in a nut that's got a lot of material around it. There's, there's a lot of friction on the sides of it, in other words. You'll notice that most nut files on the market come in a series of thicknesses that don't always match up with the string gauges in your set, and it's, it's fine to use a slightly wider file. Two or three thousandths is okay, as long as you file a nice round bottom slot. Conversely, what happens if you've only got a twelve thousandths file and you're working with a thirteen thousandths or fourteen thousandths string? It's no problem. You just roll the file slightly from side to side as you're cutting, and that's going to widen the slot and maintain that rounded bottom we prize so much. Working fast, I always protect the wood on the back side of the nut with a piece of, well this is like, it's got a plastic coating on it, it's cardboard, um, because it's possible to run into the wood back there and cause a divot or a scratch in the finish and it's very unappealing to look at. How deep do we file? You see me using that half pencil to mark a depth when I'm making those new nuts, and I'll file until I'm at the top of that pencil line. Having measured this, I know that these nut slots are pretty much where they would be had I, you know, filed down previously to the pencil line, being 40 thousandths, you know, I know I'm within the ballpark. Now on a Fender there's not as much angle to the tuner post as there would be on, say, a Gibson because of the um, orientation of the headstocks. So I'm filing only a few degrees raised from parallel with the uh, fingerboard. There's not a whole lot of angle on a Fender. Here's a cutaway side view of the nut and the slot I'm filing. I don't make a straight line. I roll it over slightly so it approaches the front of the slot as part of a radius. And this provides support behind that front edge and it makes for a much longer lasting slot. And this is what I don't want. Unsupported and putting all that pressure on a single angular point. So when you tune the wound strings they'll tend to saw right through this. and hasten the need to shim or make a new nut. So now I've got it so the feeler gauge just slips in there without displacing the string. And you can see the difference between the E string and the A, how much uh, we've come down here. If we do the press test, pressing down at the third fret, there's a little gap there. In this case there was quite a bit more. Another question would be, how deep should the string sit inside the nut material surrounding it? And the classic advice is half the diameter of the string, at least for the wound strings. Too much material surrounding it can increase drag on the string, and that can cause tuning issues. You sort of store up energy, especially if you're using, say, a whammy bar, where you've decreased the tension on the string, it slides and sticks a little bit, and as it comes back, it might not return to the same place. Another issue, especially with older guitars, say harmonies or K's, made an, in a factory where they weren't that concerned with refining the shape of the nut. They just, you know, they had to get them out of there. If you leave very deep strings, the material between them can crack off pretty easily. If it's more than, say, half the diameter of the string, um, if you knock it against something, or maybe even if you pull hard on the string, uh, you can crack it. It becomes weak. The higher strings, the E and B, I usually leave it full depth. The full depth of the string is below the surface of the nut because there are some players with rambunctious hands who can tear the strings out of the slot if they're bending hard. Found a little lisp on the E string. One of the interesting things is this has got locking tuners on it, but it's been strung up traditionally. And locking tuners are, well, there's a bit of a debate, really. What do you gain from using them on a guitar like this? A Fender with, you know, a low headstock angle. Um, if you've only got one wrap around, or even like half a wrap, on the post, you're not getting a whole lot of downward angle towards the nut. You know, guys like Dan Erlewine suggested always there would be like five wraps on the high strings and three on the low just to sort of seat that string down farther. I'm going to tape off the board and level that high fret, but I'll polish them all. Even though these are brand new there's still a kind of roughness on the top of them. It's subtle, maybe you can hear it. You could bend on them and it'll be just fine, but they could be taken a step farther 
and they'll feel like oiled glass. The other thing this guitar exhibits is a bit of a rise at the end of the fingerboard, which isn't uncommon in Fender style guitars with bolt on necks. And that continues along, you know, gently curved from the truss rod, and then it hits the uh, body here where the screws are, and it kind of kinks upward a bit. So I'm just going to um, dress a little bit of fall away into these last few frets. It won't take much. This is like, you know, three thousandths of an inch. Let's do a bunch of polishing and make our fingers real dirty. And here's the time when I'll get rid of the excess nut height. This is another task where experience comes into play. You don't want to file too low here. There are special nut lubes available. Straight graphite from a pencil works well too. I'm going to set up the bridge. The action is nice. It's 4 64ths on the bass side, 3 on the treble. That could be too low for some people, too high for others, but it's what this guitar can handle, you know. Without doing major reconstructive surgery on the frets, this is as low as it'll go without buzzing. And it's fine. That's a reasonably low saddle. Most people will be very happy with that. And these are 9 to 42 strings elixirs, so those are pretty light. We're dealing with a traditional three saddle tele bridge, so some intonative permissiveness is required. Hey, it was good enough for Keith. It's good enough for Danny Gatton. They did okay. This one happens to have the milled intonation points on it. And of course, those will be rough estimates too. They won't work for every single set of strings, you know. It's just impossible. If you were really anal retentive about intonation, I suppose you would go and buy yourself a six saddle bridge. Or if you wanted to retain the traditional look, you could, you know, set up a mill and cut away some brass and really dial it in or try and file it. But it's not what these instruments are about. Most of the traditional vintage style round barrel saddles uh, don't have grooves in them for the string. Not the old ones. Uh, they do wear in. In the 60s, Fender used a serrated or threaded rod for the barrel so that you could customize the spacing. One thing I don't like about what's going on here is due to the slant on the base saddle, this low E string is sliding down and touching the adjustment screw. That can cause problems. It's not great. So I will go ahead and file a little notch for it to keep it away. Very shallow. Just enough to keep it from migrating. String spacing at the saddle here is about two and an eighth, or like 53 and a half millimeters, which is pretty typical. It can vary a little bit. Uh, I'll just mark on either side of the string here, and then file a groove uh, between the marks. This is a 12 thousandths file. I don't need to use a great big file for this. Um, just a little nick will do it. Yeah, it's not going anywhere now. People ask about string height above the base of the bridge at the saddles. I'm sure Fender has a factory spec for that. I've just never seen it. Never come across it. I've measured them from the factory and from various setups that people are happy with. And I've seen anything from about 9 millimeters up to 13 on the G and D strings. The center ones, the ones that are the highest. Which is a pretty big spread. Fender will sometimes shim a neck pocket when there isn't enough adjustment room and I think the goal is more about getting decent action over the board than hitting an exact string height above the body. This one seems it's on the lower side of normal which is okay. It's around 10 millimeters and just about level with the top of the bridge side walls. So if the fretted or octave note is sharp the saddle has to move back away from the headstock. Conversely, if it's flat, it's got to move towards the headstock.
here's a little bonus segment. I wasn't going to film this, but I put some pictures up on Instagram and people demand it. This is an old Austrian violin. The label was loose inside, so I've retrieved it. This maker, or I think he was more like a distributor, really, was active in Vienna around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, I saw some examples online from, like, 1905. There was probably a date written right here, but the ink used seems to have been acidic. Could have been oak gall ink, which is pretty popular. It's iron sulfate mixed with tannic acid that they get from oak tree burls, basically. We see that a lot in certain medieval manuscripts, where it functions okay on vellum or parchment, but uh, it does tend to burn its way through, so you get this ghosting of the image or the script on both sides of the page. In cheap paper like this, it'll eat right through pretty quickly. Like in 50 or 60 years, it's just gone. This is an inexpensive instrument. It's not worth more than a couple hundred bucks, which is kind of crazy to think about for a handmade item of that age, but, you know, that's the value. And it had a little crack in the soundboard. The thing to do for more valuable instruments would be to pop the top off and clean it from the inside and do the whole thing, but the owner recognizes the money involved would be more than its value, so he's happy just to put some glue in the crack, clamp it closed, and see how well it does. I used hide glue, so if someone down the line wants to be professional about it, they can do it and have no problems. Here's the weird thing. These two patches, is what I'm calling them, sort of rectangular but irregular shapes, um, they're pretty symmetrical, one on both sides of the board. There's nothing like this on the back. They're inlaid. They're separate pieces of wood. There are discernible cut marks around them. Um, and they were put there after the instrument was finished and varnished. So this is an afterthought, or an addition, or a repair. This thing's had a lot of play, but there's no discernible reason I can figure out why anyone would do this. Speculation on Instagram suggested it might have been part of one of those brilliant orchestra in one box contraption things they had um, where everything was self-playing. It was like a player piano on steroids running on clockwork. And these might have been attachment points for that mechanism. As it comes to me, it's got these very old gut strings on it, which I don't think would have been used for one of those orchestrians. I could be wrong, but and it could also have been strung with these after it was removed from the machine. I just thought it was a really kind of a fun mystery. Back to the Tom DeLong. More scraping and leveling, this time for the super glue. It's hard to convey the delicacy of the touch involved. You want to float over the high spots so you're not digging a divot along each side of it. Then I'll go in and I'll sand the surface a little bit to give it some tooth for two light coats of the satin deft. This stuff works really well. I remember older formulations used to be pretty soft, at least the gloss ones were. I've had really good success with this lately on satin finishes. It sticks well, it blends very nicely. Just put it on in very light coats. It's also self-leveling in a way that I find almost hard to believe. So there we go. See, it blends in really nicely with the surrounding finish. I'm not going to string this up and play it for you i got to let it cure for a few more days, and if you want to hear what one of these sounds like, you can go back a couple of months and watch the other video when I repaired the last one. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.